Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us to, for Solve ME's Virtual Advocacy Month kickoff event. Thank you so much. My name is Emily Taylor. I'm the Vice President of Advocacy and I have a few quick housekeeping items just to share with you all about our uh, amazing opportunities that we have today for Advocacy Month. First, I want to share that um, the subtitles and translation are available. So for those of you who are joining us who prefer Spanish language, um, you will see the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom. It looks like a little uh, whirl, a globe with interpretation written underneath it. Um, when you click on that, you will have the English or Spanish options. Um, please take a moment to select the uh, the language that you would like to, re, uh, to hear. Um, we also have subtitles available for those um, who prefer to read and um, are perhaps are hearing impaired. You can activate those by clicking this, the closed caption button, which looks like a CC in a little white box, and it says closed caption underneath. If you click on that, you can choose show subtitle and all of the subtitles will appear. Lastly, um, for those of you who um, who would like to close the additional option of closed captioning, if you are on a phone, it looks like a, a toggle switch with a green background um, in your meeting settings. You can access your meeting settings by clicking the three dots on your uh, on your phone if you're using a phone or tablet. Um, just a reminder that this webinar will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash solve CFS. And as a reminder, Solve ME cannot provide medical advice. Um, and uh, if you please consult your doctor before using any experimental or non FDA approved treatments without medical supervision. Uh, with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to our organization's president and CEO, Ovid Amate. Ovid? Thank you very much, Emily. And uh, at this point in the program, my, uh, my role was going to be uh, to introduce Jalka Calgren Fozard, uh, who uh, was going to be our keynote speaker for the event. Uh, but unfortunately, just a short while ago, Jessica let us know that she is not uh, feeling well today and she's not able to uh, to join us. So uh, obviously, I'm personally very disappointed, and I'm sure uh, many of you uh, are as well. But we really had to uh, make a quick decision about uh, what to do. And um, I felt that this is, uh, you know, one of the things that Jessica was going to talk about was living with a disability. And uh, this is a reminder to all of us that uh, living with a disability uh, um, uh, makes all of us be, uh, be part of that effort. So what we're going to try to do today is what uh, I hope we can all do in our uh, different, uh, different capacities as organizations or individuals or employers, uh, and that is to, uh, to play our role to make sure that uh, Jessica can get better. And I'm sure that she'll join us uh, some other time to, uh, to share her talent uh, with us. So with that, um, Emily, going to uh, turn it back to you, and we're going to have a slight change in the program, um, but we're all going to do our best uh, to, uh, to fill in for, uh, for Jessica today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ovid. So in place of Jessica, I will be sharing uh, my story with you all and a little bit about what brought me to this advocacy space for MECFS. Um, so uh, again, just for those of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Emily Taylor. I'm the Vice President of Advocacy and Engagement here at Solve ME. I've been here since uh, 2015, uh, or 16, uh, pardon, and um, it has been an absolute joy to build, create, and work with all of you as we've built this advocacy program together from the ground up. And um, as you know, Advocacy Month, this year we'll have a whole month. Typically, we only have a week, but, um, but it's so special this year because this is such a unique moment in time. Um, and I'm really excited to share this all with you. So what brought me to this advocacy world? Um, in 2008, I was a staffer in Washington, D.C. I loved my job and really enjoyed living, breathing, eating the world of politics. And um, like many folks have uh, those experiences, I was very close with my mother, who really uh, was very worried about me being so far away from home. I'm originally from California for so long. And um, like many young people uh, struggling to make it in their early careers, uh, I had to move very suddenly and, um, and couldn't afford the place I was in. So I had to move and my mother came to help me move from across the country. And on that trip, she, um, she was forced to leave me and, in Washington DC early and go up to see my grandfather, her father, who um, was in the emergency room with a stroke. And we believe that during this period of time, my mom stayed with my, her father in the hospital for two weeks. And, um, and it was a very high stress situation. And she reported starting to feel some very strange symptoms. 
Um, on the flight back from New York, when she was returning home to California, she uh, spiked 104 degree fever. And, um, and that was sort of the beginning of her journey with MECFS. Um, so on the left there, you see the, the last picture I have with my mother and I when she was healthy, when she came to visit me at a fancy dress party in Washington, DC, because I didn't have a date and she was my date and flew all the way across the country to be my, uh, my plus one for this event. And that was the very last picture I have with her when she was healthy. Um, she returned home after that 104 degree fever, um, went to her primary care doctor who put her on antibiotics thinking that it was some kind of infection. The antibiotics didn't work. And we came to the conclusion or she, my mother and her doctor came to the conclusion that it was some kind of virus that had gotten her. And we, to this day, never really determined which virus was that initial infection, but it was very clear that she was very sick. She became bed bound, unable to eat solid food, um, sensitive to light and sound, all, all symptoms that our MECFS community is very familiar with, but we didn't know what it was. And um, for about a year, uh, my mom wasted away in bed until um, we really decided that something was seriously long, despite her protest. I left my work in DC, I moved back home to California and became a caregiver for her. And from 2009 to about 2014, 15, um, we were in a diagnostic medical odyssey, uh, trying to find out what was going on with my mother. And um, we saw endocrinologists, we saw neurologists, we saw rheumatologists, we saw all the ists in the medical field. And, um, and after, and I, and I hope I don't sound like I'm exaggerating, but truly after 20 to 30 doctors, we ended up receiving a recommendation um, to go see a doctor that was in nearly in San Diego. And for those who are not familiar with California, that's about a two and a half hour drive from Los Angeles down to, um, to see this very special endocrinologist. And unlike many of the other medical professionals that we saw during this time, this endocrinologist really listened. She took two and a half hours to do a full patient intake with my mother, ran a battery of tests, and eventually after six months or so, we came back to speak to her and she said, well, I think you have this illness. She had that, at that time, she called it chronic fatigue syndrome. She says, I'm not very familiar with it, but it, as, as I understand it, it's, it's a complex, very difficult disease, and we don't really know how to make you better, but I'm going to try, and I'm going to keep working with you, and she said, and we're going to find answers, and it was a, a miracle moment for my family. Um, after working with this doctor, my mother started really learning how to pace, learning um, how to, uh, to live within her energy envelope and started following this, th this particular doctor's recommendations, um, which now we're very familiar with as the common treatment protocols for MECFS. Um, and we were making it up as we went along. Slowly but surely, my mother did recover, um, but she is still not 100%. So I have a picture there on the, the far right um, of this was actually earlier this year where um, a friend of ours brought a puppy to visit the house. And so that's um, that's Thor also in the photo there, um, and a baby German shepherd. And um, that's my mother being able to play with a puppy, which is a magical moment for us. Um, the, it took a long time and a lot of a lot of resources and a lot of a lot of energy. But um, where my mother is today, she's about 50 to 60 percent of herself, depending on the day. Some days she still has bad days and has to stay in bed, but typically my mother's journey now is that for every one day she has out of bed at her small business playing with puppies or doing activities with her family, she has one day back in bed. And so that's 50% of my mom that I didn't have for a long time, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. As I joined my mother through this medical journey, I became um, a caregiver and a medical advisor. Um, I kept all of her medical records in a giant binder and digital file folders. I helped uh, coordinate the multiple doctors. I kept medication lists, ensured that her prescriptions are being filled properly. All of those activities that you really need a full-time personal assistant to help manage this illness. And I was very uh, fortunate that my mother trusted me with that role. And I was able to learn a lot about, um, about both medical care, our medical systems, and how medical advocacy, the same tools that I had used on Capitol Hill in DC, were actually serving me incredibly well in, um, in this new role as my mother's patient support network. Um, and what really inspired me about this experience was, um, was how when I started meeting other people with this illness and we would share information, 
um, that it really transformed everyone's life. And it, be, it introduced me to a whole new world of patient advocacy with, um, with, with these unique people like you who help each other. And that touched my heart. At the time I was working in, uh, when I finally was able to go back to work when my mother's health um, had returned, I went to work at an autism organization called um, Special Needs Network in Southern California, specializing in black and brown children with autism in South LA. Um, I learned so much at this role, but um, but I was also splitting my time with being a full-time caregiver. And it was sometime in 2016 when um, a friend of mine found a, a, a job posting that they forwarded over to me that was looking for a, uh, a communications and advocacy officer at Solve ME, which was then called the um, Solve ME CFS Initiative. And, um, and I saw that in my inbox and I knew it was how I, where I had to be. Um, so that's the story of how I came here to Solve ME. Um, I have not regretted it for a moment. I am so pleased to be here. And my, my uh, signature event, if you will, is these advocacy months. These are events that I used to plan in the autism world, but I took the model of successful autism advocacy and brought it here to the MECFS community. And now we've opened that tent even further to our friends in long COVID, in mass selectivation syndrome, in POTS or post-orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and other forms of dysautonomia. All of these patient communities really are sharing, learning, and growing together. And I really believe that as we work together, we will find answers and improve the resources from our federal government uh, to address these critical, critical issues of care, research, and education. So um, thank you all so much for listening to my journey. Um, I truly consider it a blessing to be here with all of you. And, um, and I, I see my mother and our experience in every single one of yours. And I truly believe in our model of the Empower Me, which is no family should ever learn the hard way. And I am here to make sure that hopefully none of you have to learn advocacy the hard way and that this experience as Advocacy Month is as fun, uh, rewarding, and, um, and empowering as it can possibly be. So thank you so much once again. With that, I'd like to turn it over to a really special group of ladies um, who are uh, hosting our advocacy cafes every Friday this, uh, this month. Um, these, these folks have um, so graciously given up their Fridays to share about their experiences and bring their amazing advocacy stories to this world. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, three stellar panelists who will be with us every Friday. Um, and we meet at this a Zoom link, uh, which you will have in your inboxes um, at noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time every Friday. Just a note that these advocacy cafes are not a required event for Advocacy Month. They are just fun, social, and interactive learning opportunities for us to, uh, to join, led by um, three amazing panelists. Um, and each of these folks have a unique advocacy background with a wealth of experience to share with our community. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started with, um, first, it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Ramey. Uh, Sarah Ramey is uh, a musician and writer who has been featured in the Paris Review, NPR, and too many others to name. Uh, she received an MFA in creative nonfiction writing from Columbia University and was a writer for President Obama's 2008 campaign. Sarah has been leaving, living with pain and chronic illness for 17 years and has authored her first book, which has been called a darkly funny memoir titled The Lady's Handbook for Her Mysterious Illness. Welcome so much, Sarah. Next, we have Cynthia Adenig, sorry, Cynthia Adenig, pardon, pardon me, um, a marketing specialist and an equity policy advisor. Cynthia sits on the board of Solve ME as a person with long COVID and a self-described policy nerd. She has spent over a decade engaged in community service, focused on low-income communities of color. She has been a campaign manager and a policy advisor to several political campaigns and uses her knowledge to both advocate for MECFS and the long COVID communities. She has been an incredible high profile advocate for our community and you may have seen her, her um, at some news or international speaking conferences speaking on our behalf. From all of us, thank you so much and welcome Cynthia. Last but not least, um, we have the lovely Sarah Tompkins who is an Ehlers-Danlos Sym uh, Symptom Patient Advoc Syndrome patient advocate and is Miss Wheelchair from Washington USA 2022. 
She has been a passionate advocate for invisible illness and disabilities and from countless other communities. You may remember her from Advocacy Month last year. Um, she's partnered with rare disease legislative advocates and has helped the creation of federal and state legislation for the rare disease community. Welcome so much and thank you, Sarah Tompkins. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And um, with that, I, it's, with no further ado, um, I would love to have uh, our Advocacy Cafe uh, panelists uh, take a moment to introduce themselves after that um, lengthy introduction, but to, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your stories and what brought you to, um, to advocacy for, and your journey. Um, Sarah R., if you'd like to go first. Okay, so I'm Sarah Ramey. I'm, uh, like you said, I'm an author and a musician called Wolf Larson. And, but I'm, most importantly, I'm a person with ME-CFS, with complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS, with POTS, with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Like so many people that are on this call, that like so many of our panelists, I have a lot of different acronyms and a lot of different uh, diagnoses, which is very, very common. But I did not know this when this began for me. So how it began for me, I think in my intro it said I've been sick for 17 years. That is out of date. It's now 19 years. This started uh, in 2003 when I was a senior in college. I was super healthy, happy, active, the lead singer in a very loud rock band, the director of the school musical, writer for the school paper. I did those like outdoor pre-orientation kayaking trips in Maine for freshmen, just a very, very active young person. And then uh, I had a surgery that went wrong. It was a botched surgery that I became septic afterwards. And even that, you know, that's a pretty major event, but you know, all my doctors said, you know, we're sorry this happened, but you'll be fine, you'll bounce back. Um, nothing to worry about, you're young and resilient. But I did not bounce back. I, like so many people that develop ME-CFS, overnight I went from being healthy and active to being bedridden, to feeling like I had the flu all the time, to my muscles burning and aching. And then also the, the botch surgery in my case was uh, a pelvic surgery that went very wrong. And so this, led to the development of complex regional pain syndrome and uh, the cessation of bowel function. I have an ileostomy now. But all of this was just an enormous mystery. I have two doctor parents. I was sent to every specialist in the known world to figure out what in the world has happened to this healthy, happy young woman. And in the beginning, you know, it was a real, everyone was on the case and trying to figure it out. But as my test came back negative, 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 which is you know so common for all of us because there aren't good standardized tests to identify these problems, um, a new idea started to take root in uh, my doctor's minds, which is that well, maybe since it seems like you're actually healthy and happy, or not happy, you're healthy, that maybe the problem is that you're unhappy and that maybe you need to see a psychiatrist or maybe you need to take up a hobby and stop focusing on your illness so much or any number of enormously painful and insulting um, ideas that my doctor started to tell me. But in the beginning, this is in 2003, so I did not know that this was wrong. <laughs> and so I thought, geez, I guess I should see a psychiatrist. And I did. And I started, you know, down this very, very long tumble down the rabbit hole that is so common for so many of us, thinking that I was the only person in the world that this had ever happened to. And it took several years of sort of getting better, getting worse, where I thought I was the only person. And then I met my very first, I call this Womi, is a woman with a mysterious illness, uh, or a Momi, a man with a mysterious illness, or a Pomi, a person with a mysterious illness. I met the first one who told me her story, which is, you know, just like Emily was telling the story of her mother, which is so similar to me. So many of the stories that we're going to hear, this person told me their story. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> my secret twin separated at birth. This is a miracle that I could meet the only other person in the world that has my same story. And then shortly after that, that I met the third person and then the fourth and then the fifth. 
And then I started to realize that I was not alone and that this was an enormous community of invisibly sick people that had very similar problems. And so I started to do a lot of research on my own. And then this led into the idea to start writing a book, which is what would take you know 12 years to become the Ladies' Handbook for a Mysterious Illness. And that book is about, you know, this story is we all think that we're the only one, only to realize that it's it's the same story over and over and over again, which is normal for any illness. It's you know often the very same story over and over again. And so what my work has been, which is so similar to so many of you, is to make this invisible story visible, to use words and writing to make this often very private, um, unseen experience, more public um, through through writing, through words. And so that's, that's how I kind of got here today. And I'm so excited to be a part of this group, which is such an awesome group of people. And, uh, and I'm excited to do a, a different type of advocacy instead of writing, doing, you know, knocking on doors, making the phone calls, um, making some of the uh, the push that we need to do to change the, the policies that are affecting uh, so many of us in negative ways. So with that, uh, I want to uh, turn the mic over to uh, Cynthia um, Adenig, who's fantastic, and she will uh, introduce herself to you all now. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, wow, it really resonated with me my story is very similar except for the sped up condensed story and i actually hearing your story made me realize that it was a privilege that i got sick during the pandemic when a whole bunch of other people got sick because i have a feeling that i'd still be searching for answers right now and um be pretty lost and, and maybe have one or two other people that i would know and recognize that experiencing this these very same similar um similar treatments and similar hurdles with care and um wow thank, thank you so much for sharing that so um i'm cynthia adenig i'm from northern virginia and i was one of those super people <laughs> um i didn't even i didn't even need coffee to be a very high functioning very involved person so i'm a mom um of a child genius, he's in Mensa, and um, that took a lot of my time. I was also working on political campaigns for one crazy time. I did two campaigns at once. I will never do again. That was really insane. <laughs> and um, I also was volunteering in the community. I volunteered for a breast cancer foundation that helped provide services for um, women of color. Um, so healthcare was and advocacy and that kind of thing was is not new to me at all when I got sick, um, nor was policy and legislation. As Emily said, I am a, I'm a policy junkie and um, I enjoy Senate hearings even pre-COVID. That's how I entertain myself. And um, so I did so, so, so much. I was very active in my church. Um, I'm in fact, they would have to tell me to take a day off because like I would never like every Sunday I would be there. Um, I would be there. 6 30 in the morning and would be there for like five hours every sunday without fail and i would like plan even my vacation around not missing a day to make sure i volunteered and i was head of hospitality at my church um i was running two businesses and um was doing a lot a lot of lot and um then covid happened so i had very mild covid and but I knew something was wrong because me and my son were sick at the same time and he never gets sick. And um, I never had a cough, I never had a fever. So we were actually denied a COVID test, which set me up for a whole bunch of hurdles later in down the line. And um, like a month or so later, I started getting these symptoms where I would eat and just feel weird. And I couldn't under, I just didn't know what was wrong. And it got to the point where almost two years exactly it was Mother's Day of 2020 and I ate a piece of shrimp and I just my heart was racing my jaw was tight I couldn't swallow it was lightheaded I thought I was going to pass out so I was like and I'm such a 
if you know me in person, I, I'm not like a freak out person. I'm very chill, <laughs> even if my throat's closing. So I just like casually went to like sit down and like try to gather myself and try to figure out logically what's happening. Um, because I love, love, love shrimp. I eat it like by the pound. And so I had like so many plans. <laughs> Disney Plus had just come out too. So I had plans to eat like a pound of shrimp, watch Frozen 2 on Disney Plus, And um, I had so many plans for that night. It was going to be a great foodie nerd night. And I ended up feeling so bad that I went to the ER and they said, oh yeah, you know, your heart rate's up a little high. We think it's just an allergy or anxiety. I'm like, I just ate like fettuccine Alfredo with shrimp twice last week because... <laughs> It's a pandemic and what else do you do? Um, I don't see how I could have just developed a severe allergy to one of my most favorite foods. Like there's nothing natural about that. There has to be something more. And they were just like, oh no, it's just an allergy. You know, sometimes you develop it. I'm like, mm, I'm pretty sure it's not it, but okay. Um, and then they, of course they tried to tell me it was anxiety. I'm like, I'm an introvert in a pandemic. This is like my first vacation in like six years. So I'm pretty sure I'm not anxious about playing Xbox with my son. I'm looking forward to this time. <laughs> so um, yeah, I knew I knew their explanation was like, no, there's, there's zero chance any of their explanation. And of course my labs were normal. So I was like, okay, fine. And then it happened again in another week and it happened again in another week and each time a different food. And I was like, something's very, very wrong. There's nothing normal, like nothing that I, could research or look at was saying that you would just develop all these food allergies. And it got to the point where I could no longer tolerate food or water. I still can't. Um, I can no longer tolerate food or water. Um, and so I started going to starvation dehydration quite regularly. And it was really, really scary because I declined so fast that I would walk past the mirror and not recognize my face. I was dropping weight because my heart rate I now have, you know, I now have POTS. Um, so my heart rate was in 125 in my sleep. So at, so at, being at a caloric deficit, not being able to eat or drink at the same time that my heart rate is constantly up, I was shedding weight. I shed like 40, 50 pounds in just a few months to the point where I end up becoming a wheelchair user at each time, even as this is happening, and even throughout after I became hospitalized and they discovered I had a, a hole in my esophagus. We now understand that was from, from the acid reflux from, from COVID. Um, they were still telling me it was psychosomatic and they were treating me as if I was anorexic. I'm like, um, I don't really need a reason to snack. Like there's never been a time in life where I needed a reason to snack nor has there ever been a time in life where I was so stressed out that I didn't eat. Like that would never have ever crossed my mind as a potential way to handle stress. So I was like, there's zero, no, no, there's, that's not possible. And um, it was very, very difficult because a couple months in, I started looking online and I was hearing, I was hearing about people who got COVID and didn't get better. And I was like, wait a minute, okay, what is this? This sounds interesting. And then I was reading the comments and I was like, this sounds like me. And at the time I had seen so many doctors and they kept telling me it was psychosomatic or gallbladder or something else, but perimenopause, but none of it, none of it made sense about all of my symptoms. I knew something was not quite right. So I was kept searching and searching. And by then this is like, um, maybe like June or July of 2020. And so I found a group and I went and I looked in the group and everyone was talking about the same symptoms that they were having. I was like, whoa, there's more of me? And it was by the thousands already. And I was like, how is no one talking about how there's thousands of people in this group with these illnesses? And then there was doctors in that group, there was nurses in that group, there was researchers in that group, and there was people with positive tests in the group that had the same um, symptoms as me. So I was like, I know this is COVID, but um, by the t by then, by the time they tested me for antibodies, I tested negative. Um, we now know, of course, you know, a year later that some of us don't develop antibodies, and because I had all those negative tests, they continued even like third, fourth hospitalization for starvation dehydration. Um, they continue to say it was psychosomatic and say it was PTSD and say all sorts of things, and I had one. I lucked up on one amazing doctor during one of my hospitalizations. And she was like, I don't know what you have, but I'm gonna treat your symptoms, whatever you tell me it is, I'm gonna treat it like it's real. And she did that. And that's when I got on a beta blocker, which changed my life.
Um, that's when I got physical therapy. So I learned how to walk again because no one was even addressing that 35 year old person went from just walking to like, even throughout my hospitalizations, they were just like, oh, you're free to go. And I'm like, but I still, it's great that you treated my, me for starvation dehydration, but shouldn't we start talking about like why, why I can't walk? That sounds like a big thing. And so like, but you know, it's the height of the pandemic. So a lot of resources were not available. A lot of things were missed along the way. It was really, really difficult to explain to them that I was still reacting to just drinking water. Um, but after I got on antihistamines um, at the end of, 20, of 2020, I was able to stabilize a bit and get my physical therapy and regain my independent mobility. And um, I still, I still, uh, I can't function. So I'm basically homebound. So this past year I developed further something called multiple chemical sensitivity and it has contributed to um, me not being able to tolerate air. So I have to breathe extremely filtered air and I can't even be around the smell of food cooking um, or other smells, simple smells like soap or um, the smell of my son's cha um, shampoo or his toothpaste. So it makes, it makes parenting extremely difficult even to this day. And it makes, I can't like, I'm basically a prisoner in my home. Um, so in spite of that, I was like, well, I'm going to do something. There's got to be a, something I can do from here. We're in a pandemic. A lot of people are doing things remote. So I started looking at different groups um, online that were getting involved with um, politics and policy and um, just advocacy and telling people what this looks like. Because I'm like, if I didn't know what this looked like, surely other people didn't know what this could be. And they're confused and, and they're not going to know what's wrong with them. And they're going to be just as scared that they're going to die or they could potentially die not knowing what's wrong with them. And so I was like, I'm going to make sure I'm going to do whatever I can or whatever capacity that I have, however big or small, to start telling people about what these symptoms look like and that you can have, um, you can have no cough, no fever, no loss of taste or smell. You can have none of the trait. I had none of I have no lung damage, no COVID pneumonia, none of that, and still have lung COVID. And um, thankfully, along the way, the MECFS advocates reached out to me and helped mentor me and helped me through some symptoms that doctors, not only did doctors not even ask me about, but they would have had no idea how to help me get through those symptoms. And it really increased my quality of life. And when I met them, I was like, you've been sick for 30 years. You're telling me that not only is this like not new, but this has been not new for a long time. And they didn't listen to you. And they so there's no therapies when they could have been like further along and helping us along the way. I was so upset when I heard of like the stories of how um, the struggles of MECFS advocates um, just to be heard and that they were even decades into it, they couldn't find a good primary care provider or um, their family still didn't understand that their illness was real. It just broke my heart. And I was like, I, and after they helped me to um, regain my, they helped me to rehabilitate my brain properly when no doctor would listen to me or cared. They helped me to um, get over some hurdles with my energy and, and a, a bunch of things. And they, and they really just helped me by being a friend and being and listening and being there. And um, I was like, I want to pay this forward. So I continue to be a resource for the newer long haulers, like the six months and, and, and younger, so that they don't feel scared because I knew I know how scary and daunting it is to have symptoms every day and not know if you're going to die tomorrow. Um, and I, I know how much the MECFS advocates that have been sick for a long time, they really worked hard and they were so tired and they would be sick and they would always be there like, it didn't matter if I needed some help or I needed information or I needed anything at all. They made themselves available. And I was like, I'm going to be that person to someone else. And then um, I also realized that our members of Congress didn't understand what was going on that was creating these hurdles in care. And I, as a person of somewhat privilege financially, realized that if, if someone didn't have didn't understand a system or if English wasn't the first language or if they didn't have um, proper health care uh, or insurance, then they would be experiencing so much suffering. And so that is why I start. I started doing some work with Solve and Me. I met Emily and uh, we bonded over <laughs> legislation and um, I was able to work on the long um, COVID 
Act, the Dunn Buyer Administration. We were able to get some really important changes in that legislation done to have things like MECFS and MCAS and other other syndromes that we're we all share collectively be added to that legislation so that we are not um, going to be so so that doctors can be educated even on what that looks like and, and help people in the future and I've done that with some other legislation recently as well and so that's my journey is from, from there to here and why I'm here and I'm super excited um, to be here and if anyone ever has any questions or like this correlates to you and you're like ah you're right i do have these weird food things with mecfs or with something else i'm i'm curious about that and you want to pick my brain you know you're free to find me on social media and i'm happy to answer questions it's the least i can do to pay it forward because i'm so thankful to be here i did not have to be here i did not have to be as well as i was today if it wasn't for others that um that put themselves on the line to make sure I was well, then I, I wouldn't be here. So happy to pay it forward. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That was really inspirational. And uh, and again, your journey has been so difficult and we're so glad that you are here to be able to share it with us. Um, Sarah, uh, Sarah Tompkins, uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to have you as well. Um, last but most certainly not least, would you like to share um, an introduction about how you came to uh, to this advocacy work? Thank you. Yes, I would love to. You know, I think hearing from my, from Sarah and from Cynthia, I can relate and resonate to so much of that. And even as we have uh, maybe different sister diseases or diseases, uh, the experience of being a chronic illness patient is so, I think, universal. And uh, being able, my advocacy journey really started because I was able to, after nine years of having symptoms, finally get a diagnosis from a geneticist at University of Washington here in Bellevue State. And uh, being that Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is an invisible illness, it took many years to get just that diagnosis, but little did I know that having that diagnosis opened the door for all of this testing and all of the other diagnoses that I really needed to connect all of those dots. Um, but it wasn't because uh, I was a natural advocate. It started actually because I lost my dear best friend, Kelly Seltzer Doyle. She had been on her way to the NIH for a clinical study when she became ill in her home state of Kansas with her family and largely due to an, uh, a lack of awareness and understanding um, from her treatment in Kansas uh, that contributed to her heart failure and sepsis and her becoming ill and passing away too early. And when I saw that all of the NIH studies that she was participating in shut down because she had passed, it really lit the torch in me to start advocating in any way I could. And it started locally in Washington state with establishing rare disease day with other patient advocates down at Olympia. And I had the great gift of also advocating with rare disease legislative advocates during their rare disease weeks. Um, but as I say to many, I feel like I wear many different advocacy hats. I am a disabled person, invisible disabilities, chronic illness, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, dysautonomia, POTS, the list goes on. I think EDS and Co. or ME, uh, CFS and Co. is often for us to have many different conditions and symptoms and, ish and other issues. And to be able to have that well understood by our medical care team can be very difficult. Um, and so it's been such a privilege that really through my advocacy with uh, going to different Hill Days with rare disease legislative advocates that I was able to meet Emily with Solve ME and really find that, you know, we can never have too many advocates, advocates, and there's no wrong way to advocate. Actually, uh, as an advocate, I have suffered from having doctors uh, misperceive my symptoms or chronic pain levels due to my appearance. And that has been really motivating for me to share with others that we should not be um, judged or surmised by our symptoms or pain just because of our reflection of our physical appearance. And so often with chronic illness, that happens where if you're wearing makeup or you look somewhat put together, you cannot possibly be in chronic pain or you cannot possibly be as tired or not as well as you say you are. 
And that's also been a huge motivator for me to just create more awareness and advocacy for invisible illnesses and to advocate legislatively on state and federal levels as much as I can uh, to be able to just push more legislation and policy forward for research, um, for understanding of invisible and chronic illnesses. And so I've been so lucky to just further my patient advocacy because I believe that all of us full-time patients really do have such a purpose in sharing our stories because we are the experts in our own stories. And even if we don't know an answer, we can always follow up with other advocates or organizations that might. And being able to share your story with legislators, even if it's not over a specific piece of legislation that directly impacts you, you never know how sharing that story will impact down the line. Maybe two years from now, there's a piece of legislation relating to something that impacts your patient community. And maybe they think, oh, I've met someone with that. And they think of your face and your family and your experiences. And it makes that policy and legislation all the much more powerful because you have to remember sometimes they only have four to 10 minutes to look over these pieces of legislation. So having that knowledge of knowing someone that has chronic illness or invisible disabilities or any of these conditions is invaluable um, because it really does create that relationship so that when things do happen in the future or things are happening now, legislative and uh, policy-wise, that you can really be the effective power that makes that resonate with that politician or legislator and policymaker. And uh, I'm so excited to be a part of this advocacy month because I think we can never have too many advocates. And it's so important to advocate for all of us. It's a part of my self-care personally, um, because it improves my confidence speaking, and that is reflected in my doctor's appointments. They treat me better. I get better medical care, the better advocate I am for myself and for others. And being Ms. Wheelchair Washington USA this year, my platform is practice self-care for your health care, uh, because I really, there's so many aspects of self-care and really advocacy and volunteer patient advocacy has become such a huge integral part of my self-care um, because it does improve my health, health care, and my ability of confidence in myself as a patient, as a full-time patient, as somebody with chronic illnesses. And that is so invaluable. And I'm so excited to see so many advocates with us here because we need you all to share your stories. And I couldn't be more proud to be a part of this advocacy month. Thank you so much for attending. And thank you, Emily. Thank you so much, Sarah. You're, you're making me blush over here. Um, it, truly, I'm so inspired and so so blessed to work with all of you, and especially two years in a row to work with you, Sarah. It's been it's been so wonderful. Um, so thank you all so much. I hope you all are very excited to learn more about our Advocacy Cafe panelists. Um, again, if you'd like to work with them, learn from them, communicate with them, you can join on Friday at 12 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time every Friday this month, and they will be there taking your questions and interacting on different topics throughout Advocacy Month this this, this year. So thank you once again. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Let's make sure this works. There you go. Is that everyone can share my screen? See my screen? Excellent. Um, so thank you all. I'm just going to do a quick walkthrough of our schedule of events for this year. We have a lot going on, so I just wanted to um, make sure that in, in addition to our Friday advocacy cafes, you had a whole scope of our, um, our schedule for this year. First of all, I'd like to share this, uh, this energy guide. This is something we started last year and it's back due to popular demand. Um, so you'll notice that all of the activities throughout Advocacy Month have a color coding system. Green indicates that this is a low energy activity, a short event requires minimal to no participation. So that's a green energy level event. Yellow energy levels events are medium energy levels events. These require some participation, some note taking, maybe a little cognitive effort. And anything that's red is a high energy level participation event. It requires active participation, active cognitive effort, and active note taking. Um, so hopefully this energy guide will help um, help you navigate and make your decisions about what, what events are best um, for your energy that day. So the first event I'm going to share is a yellow coded event. 
Um, this is the virtual congressional training meeting, which is coming up this week on Wednesday, May 4th at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. At this event, I will be going over in detail all everything you need to know to meet with your members of Congress the following week, including we'll also have Lincoln from Advocacy Associates who will be joining us to show you exactly um, how to use your congressional meeting tools. So for those of you who are registered for Advocacy Month and you're taking congressional meetings, you should be receiving an email today with a link to your custom schedule and um, that personalized link and custom schedule um, will walk you through exactly how to use all of that on Wednesday with a live training. Of course, we have our Advocacy Cafe chats every Friday. These are both green and yellow. Green because you have no obligation to participate. If you just wanna show up and listen, you're welcome to, but yellow if you wanna actively participate and, and become more involved in the conversations or the trainings that we're having. These weekly virtual gatherings are designed to empower the um, your experience um, and really uh, recap the highlights of Advocacy Month and offer a casual discussion with our experts who you just met. Um, this is, of course, Cynthia Adenig, Sarah Ramey, and Sarah Tompkins are our hosts for these um, recurring Friday events. Those are taking place on May 6th, May 13th, May 20th, and May 27th, again at noon, P uh, noon Pacific time and 3 p.m. Eastern time. Of course, the, the signature event, the hallmark action, the capstone action of Advocacy Month is your congressional meetings. These are rated red because they do require active cognitive effort, note taking, and, um, and energy levels. Um, your custom emails, uh, your custom schedules have been emailed to you today for all registered participants. For those of you who are not registered, registration is closed, but don't worry, you can still get involved on in the Action Center, which you can take virtual, phone, or social media actions to support the advocates who are meeting with their members of Congress this month. Um, and of course, if you are registered, don't forget to watch the preparation videos that were emailed out to you. And if you can't watch those, you can always join us at our virtual congressional meeting on Wednesday, May 4th. Obviously, the big event of May is World ME Day or International MECFS Awareness Day on May 12th. We are so proud to be a member of the World ME Alliance. Um, and on May 12th, we are taking part of World ME Day through that, uh, that international, um, international coalition. And the theme this year is what can we hashtag learn from ME? Um, so we really want to highlight this year the themes of how people with MECFS and experts at MECFS have a huge wealth of knowledge that can help improve the management and experience of people with chronic illnesses throughout the world. But even with the best management approaches that are available, there is still no actual cure or FDA approved treatment for MECFS, which is why the members of the Alliance are calling for more research funding. Um, also noting that May 12th is millions missing as well. Um, so all of that is taking place on the same day and that'll be a really exciting day for, um, for our community. Um, looking forward to, to, uh, to later in May, on May 19th, we have our first in-person, but it is also virtual, so it's a hybrid event um, for, uh, in New York um, on May 19th called Long COVID Research Policy and Economic Impact. This is a full day conference exploring long COVID. We have some really cool speakers, including the 2022 uh, Nobel Prize nominees for their work in, um, in COVID vaccination and some really insightful folks um, joining us to, uh, to look at some of these complex issues around long COVID, chronic illness, healthcare policy, and the economic impact of these various, uh, these various uh, conditions. Um, again, this is virtual and in-person. Uh, congressional meeting participants do receive free virtual registration. So make sure to check your email for the code in order to get free virtual registration if you're registered um, for congressional meetings. Uh, and we're just noting that this event is in partnership with the Global Interdependence Center. Last but not least, the big event that we always have every year that is um, growing and becoming such a such an, uh, a staple of our annual events is the Empower ME Roundtable. Every year we pick a different topic based on what our, we're hearing from our advocates that folks are interested in learning about. In previous years, we've done empowerment in the doctor's office, we've done navigating social security. This year, the call was definitely from learning about state and local actions. So our Empower ME Roundtable will focus on all politics is local and what does that mean for ME CFS and long COVID? We have an amazing panel of veteran state and local advocates as they discuss what they've done locally and in their state level. And um, we're specifically going to hear about initiatives in California, Florida, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Delaware, and New York. 
Um, so learn the tips for starting your projects locally in your neck of the woods. That'll be held on May 26th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. That's 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, here's our speakers for the Empower Me Roundtable. Just a quick snapshot. Um, most of these faces you may have known but, or are familiar with. But again, we have such amazing representation from around the country to really look at what, um, what you can do locally to, uh, to empower your community and bring your action, your advocacy and action to your local community. Um, last but not least, I just want to have a special thank you to our sponsors and partners this year. Um, a very special thank you to Rare Disease Legislative Associates who are um, helping pay for the translation support you have here. So for all of our Spanish language participants, welcome and thank you. We're so glad to have you. Um, with also an excellent uh, extra gratitude to our partners um, who have helped be a part of Emmy Advocacy Month this year, um, Body Politic, Emmy Action, COVID-19 Long Hauler Advocacy Project, uh, Long COVID Families, uh, the Patient-Led Research Collaborative, and Amera Disability. Thank you all so much for being our partners this year. Um, we are so happy to have you. And last but not least, if you are not um, registered for congressional meetings but still want to get involved, I mentioned the Action Center. These are the links to the online Action Center. It is also available in Spanish. Um, and for more information, you can always go to our website, advomonth.org. Or again, we have that also available in Spanish. If you go to advomonth.org and click the, the Spanish language page, it'll take you right there. Or there's a direct link on your page right there as well for the Spanish language participation. We have a really great and beautiful uh, social media campaign. Our hashtags are hashtag stop the long haul, hashtag care for long COVID, and hashtag treat long COVID. Um, and these are some uh, really, really great little flyers on the right hand side that you can see as part of our social media campaign that you can print out at home and take a picture to be part of these, uh, these, these efforts on social media. So with that, um, I have a very special world premiere to share with you all. Um, at, at, on May 12th, in honor of World ME Day, Saul of ME will be re releasing the very first episode of Long Haul Voices, a mini series we created in partnership with Unfixed Media Production that amplifies the experiences of individuals with ME and long COVID. So um, without further ado, I'd just like to take a quick moment to share the world premiere of this trailer with you all. Being in my body now, is a mixture of acceptance and denial. I can't really exercise anymore. And, um, sorry. I still, in my head, think I can go and run if I wanted to. After the first bout of COVID, be walking the dog and my, I would be thinking, when did this become so difficult? Even something as simple as walking down the hall becomes a monumental task. If I save up all my energy for like a week, I might be able to go out to dinner with friends. It's pretty much one or two activities that I can manage per day. There's so much mom guilt that I had um, because I couldn't do what I used to do. Having to accept you need to take a different path in life because of chronic illness is quite hard. Those will be available on YouTube and also on, um, on a, a local channel near you with more information coming on World ME Day. Um, with that, I would like to um, wrap up our presentation for today. Being in my body now. Apologies. <laughs> um, wrap up our presentation for today and answer a couple of the questions that came in through the chat. Um, so I just wanted to note that um, for those who are asking about more information about our actions this year, um, please join us at our congressional meeting training or later this week. That's where you'll have all of the information available for, um, for this bill specifically and to answer your questions about what our, our requests are for MECFS this year. Um, and I received another question about uh, what is the what do these bills have to do with MECFS, um, which I'm very excited, Cynthia. Um, props to you again for helping us write some of that that legislative language. MECFS is integrated as a related post-infection illness, um, along with several other conditions, which is why you can see we have so many broad partners from other chronic illness dis disability communities this year because we really are building a big tent and inviting everyone to join us as part of this massive effort to get post-infection illnesses funded uh, and um, and research and, of course, uh, improving outcomes for patient care for all of our folks in our community. Um, 
Last uh, last question I did receive was, will there be a way to watch the May 4th training online later? Um, how do you access it? Absolutely. It'll be available both on our website, advomonth.org, and on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash solve CFS. So that'll be amply available, and we'll make sure to share that with you. Last question I just wanted to ask, uh, or answer rather, um, Jennifer asked, is there a way to access previous Empower ME roundtables? Absolutely. Once again, those are on our website under Empower ME. On the drop down menu under advocacy, there's a whole page for all of our Empower ME events. Um, so with that, I'll, we have just a couple minutes left. So um, to our Advocacy Cafe chat panel, thank you so much once again for being here. Do you have any final thoughts, um, either or, that or Ovid, that you'd like to share with our audience today? Thank you very much. It was uh, so moving. I really, really appreciated uh, all of you sharing your stories and uh, and we wish Jessica uh, a speedy recovery. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we'll wrap up for today. I hope you, this really inspired you, empowered you. I hope you're really fired up and ready to go for an amazing advocacy month this year. Um, we're so excited. We have lots of events. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email our team at solvecfs at solvecfs.org. And with that, we will wrap up for today. And um, I wanna also do a last thank you to Fernanda. Thank you so much for our Spanish interpretation. You have been amazing. And I hope our Spanish language community has enjoyed this presentation as well. Thank you so much. We'll see you all uh, on Wednesday for the congressional meeting training. Take care and goodbye. <laughs>